it. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started with Grand Rounds today. It's 8 o'clock. My name is Russell Swan. I'm moderating today. So we have two medical students that will be presenting today. First one is Tyson Olson. Tyson's visiting us from the University of Rochester. So he's no stranger here. He grew up in South Jordan, went to undergrad at BYU, and today he'll be presenting on orbital facial neurofibromatosis and vision loss. He worked with Dr. Dries the first two weeks and then now is working with Dr. Tyson. So, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for being here and for allowing me to speak at Grand Rounds. And like Russell said, I'll be talking today about orbital facial neurofibromatosis and specifically the causes of vision loss um, in this um, disease. Um, and so I'm going to start out with a case of a patient who was co-managed by both Dr. Patel and Dr. Dries. Uh, he was referred from pediatric genetics uh, for neurofibromatosis type 1 as well as some upper left eyelid swelling. And at that time, he was a six-month-old boy. Uh, his mother reported that since birth, he had had excessive tearing, redness, and a rubbing of his left eye. Uh, he was born at 36 weeks via cesarean section. Uh, other than neurofibromatosis type 1, he had no other medical problems, and he had no previous surgeries. Um, his mother did have neurofibromatosis type 1, and his social history, he lived at home with his mother and his father. On examination, uh, his pupils were equal and reactive, and he didn't have any afferent pupillary defect. Um, and his visual acuity, he was able to fix with his right eye, but it was noticed that his left eye uh, was able to fix, but was um, doing less so than his right eye. He had full ductions inversions. His cornea lens, optic nerve, and fundus were unremarkable. And on external exam, he had uh, left uh, proptosis, left upper lid ptosis, and his corneal refle reflex uh, lid margin distance on the left was 0 0.5 millimeters as compared to 3 millimeters on the right uh, with a soft tissue mass over the medial aspect of his brow and his forehead area. And on cycloplegic refraction, uh, his right eye had a plus one sphere and he had 2.75 diopters of astigmatism on the left eye. You can see here, this was when he presented, uh, when he was six months old. Um, you can see his brow hair is raised, and he has the ptosis on the left. And it's kind of taking an S shape, which is uh, characteristic of this disease, as the neurofibromas often affect the lateral aspect <coughs> of the upper lid. You can see some facial fullness here as well, as well as some downturning of the uh, lateral part of his lips here on the left side as well. An MRI uh, did reveal an extensive plexiform neurofibroma uh, that had orbital and cavernous sinus, as well as skull base and facial involvement, um, as well as some component of uh, sphenoid wing dysplasia. And there was no uh, features of optic pathway gliomas at that time. Uh, a visual evoked potential was performed that showed poor uh, wavelengths on the left eye. And his clinical course, uh, was the following. He was given glasses to correct his astigmatic anisometropia. At nine months, he underwent left external levator resection and left anterior orbitotomy and reduction of the orbital tumor. Uh, and six months post-op, you can see here, his visual evoked potential significantly improved on the left eye. Um, he did continue to have progressive uh, myopia and astigmatic anisometropia with his latch refraction coming in at negative uh, 5.50 uh, plus 3 at 85. And at age 3, he had to undergo another surgery to debulk the neurofibroma further. And this is a picture of him after his first surgery. Um, so you can see some improvement, well, some um, progression of his ptosis laterally, taking on more of an S shape, uh, but still uh, keeping away from the visual axis. So neurofibromatosis type 1 is an autosomal dominant disorder uh, characterized by a mutation in the NF1 gene on chromosome 17. And it has an incidence of about 1 in 2,600 to 1 in 3,000 individuals, with about 50% of those cases being de novo mutations, which actually increase with increasing paternal age. Um, the pathogenesis is the following. Uh, you have RAS here, which is uh, active in many signaling pathways in the cellular uh, growth and proliferation cycle, including MAP kinase pathway as well as mTOR, 
And in order to inactivate RAS, neurofibromin activates a GTPase, which dephosphorylates RAS, uh, leading to inactivation of RAS. And so without NF1, uh, you get um, continued activation of RAS, leading to unchecked growth and proliferation of cells, especially in neural tissues. Um, diagnostic criteria is a clinical uh, criteria to diagnose neurofibromatosis. You need two, of, two or more of the following, uh, which include uh, six or more cafe au lait spots, two or more neurofibromas, or one plexiform neurofibroma, as well as freckling in the axillary or inguinal, re inguinal regions, optic gliomas, greater than two iris hamartomas, or a first degree relative with NF1, or bony lesions such as sphenoid dysplasia. The ocular manifestations include leash nodules, which are hamartomas of the iris pigment epithelium, as well as optic pathway gliomas, which are present in about 15 to 20 percent of patients. These are usually asymptomatic and histologically benign, although when symptomatic, they can cause painless visual loss, proptosis, strabismus, and nystagmus. And the visual loss depends on where these uh, tumors are growing in the optic pathway, anywhere from causing scotomas to hemianopsias. Orbital facial neurofibromatosis has actually been kind of thought as as a separate entity or a unique variant of NF1, and estimates say that it occurs in 1 to 22 percent of patients with NF1, and it's char characterized by neurofibromas that cause progressive disfiguring tumors of the orbit and face. Uh, interestingly, it's most commonly unilateral. Um, the neurofibromas tend to favor the upper eyelid, brow, and temporal region, and they have a higher growth growth rate than neurofibromas elsewhere in the body and um, undergo aggressive growth, especially early in childhood, that tends to improve with age. Um, these tumors cause significant functional, functional and cosmetic effects as well. Some of the uh, sequelae of orbital facial neurofibromatosis in the eyes are globe enlargement, especially if the tumor involves the orbit. And this leads to uh, myopia, which can lead to posterior staphyloma or myopic macular changes. Uh, patients with orbital facial neurofibromatosis are also at risk for glaucoma. Uh, they get bony changes of the skull and orbit, like sphenoid uh, bone dysplasia, like our patient had, as well as S-shaped ptosis, uh, proptosis, and especially pulsatile proptosis if they do have uh, dysplasia of the sphenoid bone, and occasionally strabismus as well. Uh, this top strip of patients are three separate patients, and you can just see the difference in severity of orbital facial neurofibromatosis from slight ptosis here uh, to more significant S-shaped ptosis causing occlusion of the visual axis to uh, involvement of the entire left face causing significant um, cosmetic and functional disability in this patient. And this patient here is uh, shown here 18 months and 24 months. You can see the rapid progression of his ptosis in the, that six-month period. And um, interestingly here, you see that he's kind of taken on a left face turn in order to keep his visual axis clear on the left eye. This is an MRI showing sphenoid bone dysplasia here on the CT scan with an orbital tumor as well as a cavernous sinus tumor uh, with proptosis and globe enlargement. A recent study looked at 55 patients with orbital facial neurofibromatosis to determine the cause of visual loss in these patients. And out of these 55 patients, 39 of them, or 71 percent, had significant visual loss on the affected side, um, less than 20 over 60, with a mean visual acuity of 20 over 400 on that side. And the most common cause for visual loss in this group of patients was amblyopia either from refractive error or from deprivation from the ptosis. And other causes included glaucoma, optic pathway gliomas, um, optic atrophy, retinal detachments, and as well as astigmatism. So you can see from this um, study that these patients really do have uh, significant visual loss on the side, um, and early intervention is necessary to prevent visual loss in these patients. So in summary, orbital facial neurofibromatosis is a rapidly progressive disease that causes significant morbidity and mortality, uh, both functionally and cosmetically. Um, a multidisciplinary approach is necessary to treat these patients, including a pediatric ophthalmologist, as well as an oculoplastic surgeon. 
Um, children less than five require frequent examinations, uh, both to uh, monitor progression of tumor size, um, changes in refractive error, as well as uh, screen for glaucoma. Uh, the visual loss in this disease is usually multifactorial, um, with amblyopia due to refractive error and deprivation being the most common. And although glasses are difficult to wear due to the facial tumors, um, it, is, it is necessary to uh, make every attempt possible to provide adequate optical correction in these patients in order to prevent amblyopia. And also, despite the rapid growth and recurrence of the tumors in young children, early brow ptosis repair uh, may be necessary to keep the pupillary axis clear and prevent deprivational uh, amblyopia as well. And these are my references. And I'd like to thank Dr. Dries for allowing me to work in his clinic over the last few weeks, as well as Dr. Patel for allowing me to use the pictures of the patient in this case, and as well as Alicia Doxon for making my rotation here at Moran possible. And thank all of you for allowing me to speak today as well. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.